overall solution, I think, would, would be federal for everyone. This is a problem everywhere in our country. So that would be ideal. But that doesn't happen without lower levels of government doing it first. Mm -hmm. And some Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Dalk. Today we have two guests. We have Lisa Frack, who is with the uh, Family Forward Oregon, and we have Marco Mejia, who is with Portland Jobs with Justice. Uh, we're first going to talk with Lisa. Lisa is a communications director with Family Forward Oregon. She formerly was a social justice manager for, for the Environmental Working Group. So welcome to the show, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me. I'm glad Good. to be here. Good. So what we want to talk about today is the uh, sick pay campaign. Uh, so why don't you just start out and just tell us what the sick pay campaign is about. Absolutely. Um, so we in Portland have um, a, a situation where lots of the folks who work don't earn paid sick time while they're working. So the numbers are, are, are around 41 percent of private sector workers who don't earn a single paid sick day when they're sick. So the problem with that... Which, which is absolutely phenomenal to me that 41 percent of the population doesn't have sick pay. I mean, yeah. Just for myself, yes. every I four thought people. That, that, yeah, that yeah. is an amazing figure. It is shocking, right. and honestly, when we have shared this information with a lot of folks, people who have paid sick days, people who don't have paid sick days, um, elected officials over the last year and a half, a lot of folks have been shocked. I think folks who do earn paid sick days, as a as a matter of course, which tends to be higher paid office workers, they kind of think it's. It isn't a problem because everyone must have them, mm -hmm. and surely it's kind of been dealt with before as a labor law, mm -hmm. but it hasn't. So yeah, I think a lot of people are surprised that the four in ten people walking by them on the street don't have that option to stay home from work when they're sick or to take care of a family member when they're sick either, which is, you know, for, for, for parents, which for our organization is a lot of the, the folks that we pay attention to, it's sort of a double problem, and that's true because they have sick kids, kids get sick all the time, and also for folks maybe who don't have kids but have parents of their own to take care of who need time. Um, so so the, the general problem looks, looks like that, that there's a lot of folks, our, our neighbors, our community members who are going to work and working hard but not able to care for themselves when they're sick. And the, the way that plays out, I think, is not only are they not taking good care of their own health, maybe seeing a doctor during working hours when it's more affordable or when they need to see the doctor, but they can't take care of children or their family members when they're sick, or they're also they're at work and they're getting their coworkers sick, which we all mm -hmm. know, I think, from our lives working, how that goes. So everyone gets sick at work instead of just one person who can stay home, sort of keep the contagiousness in the house, and then come back when they're not contagious anymore. Mm -hmm. So, um, and same thing with children. When sick children go to school, other kids get sick, and that's sort of everybody knows how that goes, and teachers get sick. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a little bit spreads throughout the community. Right, yeah, I, I think I've seen a slogan that says something like, a, and the illness to one is a contagion to all, or something like that. Or, or, yeah, it's or, hard to it's contain, contain like when that. you're sick. Right. And uh -huh. it's hard to know, honestly, when you're contagious, too. Sometimes that's, a, that's an art. Um, but schools have rules, and so do restaurants and, and food service places where they say, nope, don't want your kid within 24 hours of a fever, and please, no, you cannot come to work mm -hmm. if you have these several illnesses, which is the right way to do things, I think, to keep contagion down. But if you don't give people the paid time off to follow those rules, then they, people don't tend to follow them, and right. we end up kind of with... Right, so, so parents who have ch sick children aren't able to stay home with the children are probably sending them to school or, right. or whatever, right. even in spite of the fact that they're ill. Yes. And when they themselves are ill, they also still probably have to continue to work because I would assume that people who don't have paid sick days are probably also people who are getting paid low wages. Yes, and that's, that's an excellent point. We have data on a, several of those points, but one is an important one, which is the folks, I think it's 84% 80, of folks who make, say, in the top 15%, and this is nationally, not just in Portland, earn paid sick days, and 15% of the folks who make in the bottom quarter are earning paid sick days. So it's just the folks who can't afford to lose the pay and stay home who don't earn the paid sick days. So that is very much a reality where your lower wage workers in, in, in low wage sectors, which tend to be the service sectors where workers are interacting with their customers also. So then you have that piece, which mm -hmm. is customers coming into restaurants and health care healthcare places and grocery stores, and they're being served by folks who often go to work sick. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, right. And so there's a real equity issue here too. Yes, right. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And there's equity along the socioeconomic lines that we just talked about, which is the, the wages, and also there's there's an, there's an ethnic breakout also. So da the data we have for here in Portland shows that the Latino population, those Latino workers, um, have their 57% of them don't earn a single paid sick day, and that's compared to 39% of white workers. So oh, it's pretty significant. Okay. So that's a population mm -hmm. that um, is really feeling it every day more than the rest of us. So, mm -hmm. and that's, um, there was actually a rally at City Hall here on, on October 31st where CAUSA Oregon, which is a um, immigrants right organization, and they brought a lot of folks into City Hall and testified um, during a regular City Hall meeting just to say, this is really an issue for us and we're, we're working and we're sending our kids to school sick and we're not, and we're working sick and we can't afford to lose the pay. Okay, and, and do, you have, do you have a specific um, proposal that you're working on here in Portland? Right. You know, um, it's not. It's actually not officially been released yet by the city council, but there is a there is a proposal in progress. And so what's what's been happening is um, uh, we are part of a large coalition of organizations who are interested in seeing a solution to this problem. And that coalition has been talking with the business community and city council for quite some time and brought sort of a, a table of stakeholders together. I think the first meeting might have been September. And so they had several meetings to sort of say, you know, let's look at our unique economy here in Portland. Let's look at some of the policies that have already been passed and how they're doing, and let's see what we can create here that makes sense here. So that policy is sort of moving forward, and there's a draft, but it has not been released okay. yet. So. Okay. And, and who, who else is part of the coalition? Well, we are. Um, we have a lot of labor groups, um, which which is interesting in the sense that because they they negotiate obviously for different benefits for their workers and. Um, some some of the the paid sick day policies they've been able to negotiate are what they call third day sick, which means you earn paid sick days, but you can't actually get paid until you've been out three days. Mm -hmm. So the first two you must take unpaid to access your own paid sick time. So they're interested in seeing this solution um, so that their workers don't have to lose two fifths of their week's pay in order to have a paid sick day, which they've earned. So right. it's a little bit of an, it's an awkward setup, but um, it prohibits a lot of their workers whom we've talked to from using their paid sick days. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some unions who are members of our group, lots of public health advocates, um, upstream public health, um, Oregon Nurses Association, um, Working Families Party, um, Children First for Oregon. There's quite a long list, honestly. It, I think because it touches public health, it's an obvious public health issue, and it touches sort of workers' rights. And then we also have a lot of businesses at the table because it touches them, clearly, because it's a policy that plays out in the workplace. Uh -huh. Okay. So. Yeah, and is this a, a campaign that's just happening in Portland or uh, nationally? Or is this a national program or how right? Well, uh, that's an excellent question, and it's um, it's actually happening all over the country. Um, as a nation, we are quite far behind um, most of the industrialized nations around the world, which isn't super surprising given no. that in lots of these sort of workplace and work family issues, we are behind. Um, so there's, San Francisco was the first city, first anything actually, first any level of government to pass a policy in 2007. They had a ballot measure and it passed. So they've had it in effect since 2008. Um, Washington DC has passed a policy. Milwaukee, Wisconsin actually, actually passed a policy but they've got some interesting dynamics there between local and state government where the state, the, the governor um, sort of stepped in to make that not, not happen. Um, and then uh, the state of Connecticut passed a law in 2011, I think. And then Seattle's just went into effect this September. So, and there's current campaigns underway in Miami, in Philadelphia, in New York. So it's, um, I think it's an issue that people are, once you know that yeah. number, those statistics, and nationally, 80% of low-wage workers don't earn a sick day. So it's kind of, it's um, lots of people are paying attention and trying to solve it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, I, I've seen a couple of articles, uh, editorials in the Oregonian, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that one of them said that uh, this is a, a, a this is a, a fine thing that we should do, but that we shouldn't do it at the city level. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think the more, what I want, the, the overall, solution I think would would be federal for everyone this is a problem everywhere in our country so that would be ideal but that doesn't happen without lower levels of government doing it first mm -hmm. and sometimes that's the state and sometimes it's not I'd say in our case Portland is the largest city in Oregon by a long shot and they know about this problem and they have the ability to solve it 
much more quickly than mm -hmm. the state does. Um, and I'd say the Portland economy is unique in Oregon. Um, being its largest city, a lot of the places in Oregon are rural. Maybe a policy that in those places could look different. Um, but I think that the city, the city council here shouldn't wait and pass the buck on a clear community problem to the state legislature in hopes that they might someday solve it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't yeah. feel responsible. But, right, yeah. It does seem like uh, democracy works best when it comes from the local level. And mm -hmm. so the Oregonian mm -hmm. is suggesting just the opposite, that we need to have a, a top-down kind of policy direct drive, you know, um, a process instead of a right. bottom up. We, right. I, you know, democracy works best when it comes oh, to the Oh, it bottom. does. I think there is a, um, pardon the expression, but there's a trickle up, I think, phenomenon with mm -hmm. these kinds of things where a local a local government will identify a problem and really say, we, don't, we and Portland is, I think, one of those places that spends some time thinking about how we want to be. Mm -hmm. We like, we are, we define ourselves a lot and, and, and to good end, I think. And here's another opportunity to do that. And I don't think, typically we don't punt to the state to say, why don't you figure out how to recycle? Right. So. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, for people who would want to get involved with your campaign, how, how do they do that? Well, the best place is always oh, these days a website. So there's a website. Our campaign is called Everybody Benefits Portland um, because we think everyone benefits here: workers, businesses, and public health um, and children. Um, so everybodybenefitspdx.org would be okay. the place to go. And there's um, a place to tell your story if you're affected by paid sick day by not having paid sick days or by having them. Lots of people realize that they couldn't get along without it. Um, so they can share a story, take action by signing a petition, contact city hall. Um, and learn about the issue too, and find out what some local businesses are saying about why they support the issue. Okay. Um, it's a yeah. good resource. Is there a uh, national website for folks who are watching outside of Portland? Yeah, you know, I would say the best place to go is, I believe it's paidsickdays.org, which is run by the National Partnership for Women and Families, which oh. is a national organization that has been doing some data crunching on this issue and, and really looking at it for a couple oh. years. Okay, so, excellent. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much for oh. being here, Lisa. Oh, thanks so much for having All me. Right. It was a pleasure. Good. Thank you. A sort of a bill of rights for workers that they understand you know the basic rights you know when you're being hired that you have the right to ask who the names of the employer uh, the their information where they're taking them how much money they're gonna pay them and they need to write it down and that they can have that information uh -huh. something that sometimes doesn't happen you know they take you to a place they make you work and they just pay you a little bit of money less than what they said that they're gonna pay mm -hmm. or sometimes they don't pay you at all and they, you know, or sometimes they disappear. They tick. So we are, we are back now. Uh, we have Marcos Mejia uh, here in the studio with us. Uh, he is the worker power organizer with Portland Jobs with Justice, and he's currently working on a wage theft campaign. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Okay, Good great. Time. Yeah. So, wage theft. What is wage theft? Well, wage theft is uh, something that is a pretty big problem that many people don't think so uh, and also many people have faced that so wage theft is simply the wages that you have not been paid for the work that you did so there's many different ways in how um, businesses and bosses you know are, are stealing the wages of workers the most typical ones are the ones that you know they make you work for for a number of hours but they pay you for less hours mm -hmm. uh, they don't pay you over time over time should be paid at one and a half, uh, or they pay you uh, less than the minimum wage. The minimum wage in Oregon is 880, I think, mm -hmm. uh, right now, uh, this year, and they pay you less than that. Or um, in many cases, they don't pay you at all. And, and, oh. and the other way that's the typical way of uh, stealing wages, you know, is for uh, restaurant workers when they don't uh, give it back to the workers, the, the tips. So many of them keep the tips. If you pay you a credit oh, card, the employer, the employer oh, oh, they oh, okay. keep the tip for them, and they include it as their their profit, but not uh, that they something that needs to give it back to the to the worker. And that's yeah. pretty high. It's a pretty pretty high. That's um, pretty prevalent. Way. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like it seems like that would be a clear case of fraud. Exactly. Yep. Right. Yep. But you know. Uh, our uh, legal system is not strong enough that will 
uh, get all these employers accountable with, with what they're doing. You know, mm -hmm. there's a system already. You know, with Bolly, the the Bureau of uh, Labor and Industries, uh -huh. um, that they take cases. Um, uh, but you know, the situation is so big. Um, just for an example, uh, I think in, in the last five years, um, it, there has been about 8,500 um, complaints. Uh, submitted uh, worth about $25 million, right? But that it's only the ones that have been reported, which is a very small sure. uh, mm -hmm. amount on that, right? Uh, of the, the whole problem. So the problem is big. There's no statistics because it's very difficult to get real statistics out of it. Uh, because usually uh, the problem is that um, the workers are uh, scared to report because you know they're gonna lose a job. And usually our workers, the low income workers, and, and and um, uh, immigrants, the ones that are being affected by it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and for, for immigrants, I presume that there is at least some fear that um, whether they're legal immigrants or illegal immigrants, mm -hmm. that you know, if they complain, then they're going to be yeah. found out and, and um, they're Yeah, status. exactly, yeah. Right. I, I will call them undocumented immigrants. Uh -huh. Uh, and uh, they especially uh, won't report because it's very, you know, they're afraid of losing the job. Uh, and any other workers in general, you know, because uh, I think that uh, especially low-income workers, you know, uh, they depend on that completely, you know. The mm -hmm. little few hours here, a couple of hours there that they can get, you know, to pay, um, you know, for food and what the basic needs that they have is what, what really gets them, you know, not reporting and, and just going, mm -hmm. you know, along with it. Um, I think it, it is important to understand that, you know, right now uh, the Oregon uh, Coalition uh, to Stop the Wage Theft uh, comes, you know, from a few years ago, and JavaScript Justice is a member of it. Uh, same as, uh, I think there's about uh, about 30 or 40 members uh, of the, 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 the coalition mm -hmm. uh, and the campaign is, you know, to, to stop the wage theft. And we have included in the members, we have unions, we have uh, community organizations, human rights organizations, uh, et cetera, that are really, you know, worried about, you know, workers' rights, especially, that, you know, we can change that, that, that injustice, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And, and um, some of the coalition members, can you give us some idea what kind of organizations are, are members? Well, let, let's see if I can get out of my head. <laughs> uh, you know, among the unions, we have SEIU 49, SEIU 503, UFCW 555. Uh, I think that the, the AFL-CIO, even the, as a federation, mm -hmm. I think is part of it too, uh, or supporting the campaign at least. Uh, we have the Oregon New Center Movement, which is faith communities that are connected to immigrant rights that supports it. Uh, we have also congregations that support it, that have decided that they want to support this campaign mm -hmm. uh, from a very broad, you know, uh, spectrum of, of faiths, you know, Muslims, Jewish, Christian, et cetera. Uh, we have um, a, other organizations that are related to um, law, you know, and, and, and workers' rights. I don't remember sure. the okay. uh -huh. <laughs> from the top uh -huh. of my head. So it's a very diverse group of people, you know. We have uh, Mujeres Adelante, which is a group in, 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 in Cornelius, I think. We have Causa, we have Pecun, uh -huh. um, that, you know, Pecun works with uh, farm workers, etc. So it's a pretty big group mm -hmm. that, that we gather. Okay, yeah. all right. So restaurant workers, farm workers, casual workers mm -hmm. are primarily affected? They other, are. Other, other, other kinds construction of construction workers construction. is the other one that is pretty big. I think uh -huh. that in between construction workers and restaurant and services, that kind of services workers are the ones that are more affected. And on the other hand, we have, you know, the day laborers, uh -huh. uh, which are the workers that don't have a work at all and that they come to a corner mm -hmm. uh, and looking for a job and they get a job for one day, four hours, a month or two days, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, uh, I think that um, one of the things that the campaign is working on is, uh, well, actually two things that would be important to understand. One is that the campaign is, is trying to change, you know, policy mm -hmm. so that, that the policy, uh, you know, comes up with laws that is, are going to take really accountable to the employers uh, and, and change the, the conditions and how it works and the system, how it works. Uh, one example is that, um, you know, the, the, to have a sort of a bill of rights for workers that they understand, you know, the basic rights, you know, when you're being hired that you have the right to ask who the names of the employer, 
uh, the, their information, where they're taking them, how much money they're going to pay them, and they need to write it down and that they can have that information. Uh -huh. Something that sometimes doesn't happen, you know. They take you to a place, they make you work, and they just pay you a little bit of money, less than what they said that they're going to pay, mm -hmm. or sometimes they don't pay you at all. And, and they, you know, or sometimes they disappear. They take you to a job. They were the ones that just hired the workers. They charge already the place. They bring the workers, leave them there working, and they just leave and disappear. Uh -huh. Things like that. So there's many ways of how uh -huh. people are being, you know. Uh, same thing as I said, you know, uh, the other thing is um, with the tips. Uh, it's, uh, we recommend that usually people pay uh, the tips with cash. So always have, you know, Doro bills changed to pay the tip because in many places, I think it's pretty high, it's like 60% of uh, restaurants, they don't give it back to their workers. So, so it's, mm. uh, I'm not sure about the, 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 sure. the number, but it's big, uh -huh. it's big. So it's better, you know, to think about that and, and do it that way. So at least a little change until we change, you know, the, uh -huh. Okay. The laws. Yeah. So, so is, it, is it really a matter of changing laws or is it a matter of enforcing laws that already exist or is it a combination? Well, it's a combination, I think. Uh, also, I think that uh, the, the government has to create more capacity to respond to these kind of cases. I think that there is not enough capacity with 8,500 cases, you know. I think that they have a few staff people that can handle things. So, so, so you talk, when you say capacity, you're talking about people who could investigate the complaints. Exactly, and, that can investigate, that, that can, can exactly, and then process that and, 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 uh, and uh, make the, you know, the, the, the laws and the regulations, you know, to be controlled, right? Uh -huh. So it happens in a way, but uh, at the same time, it's not in a way that it's really taking accountable to the employers. So the changes that are happening, as a, the, the example I put, you know, is that kind of change that will help to, to, um, to the workers to have the information who they're working to. The other thing is that, you know, if, if somebody didn't pay, uh, something that's going to change in one of the laws is there is about six or seven bills that are going to be introduced. It's saying that, um, that if somebody's not paying, you know, sometimes they get away saying, well, I don't have money. There's no money in the bank. Uh. I don't have anything. So... The change is that, you know, the workers can come back and get them accountable and get, you know, if they have property, their truck, their tools, etc., uh -huh. that they can recover as the amount as they, you know, they were stolen. Oh, yeah. And those. The other thing that is important to understand is that there has been the other component of the campaign is the organizing. I think that, you know, the only way for workers to, to make, uh, you know, their, their rights to be exercised is usually, you know, uh, especially when they're organized. So um, they had already, we had a, a few weeks ago, um, gathering of workers that have been facing wage theft. So they got together about 40 workers in this area and they're working and getting organized and see how you know they can continue working on the campaign and continue educating other workers, fellow workers, and, and see how they can change. The other thing is that they, this, uh, uh, an organization especially called We Are Oregon, yes. and they are doing um, a lot of direct actions. So they have a hotline, I don't remember the, the number, but if you go to uh, online and you just go to weareoregon.org, mm -hmm. and they can just get into it and get the information if you need it to. Uh, so what they're doing is taking, getting cases you know, of workers that have been stolen the wages and, and literally asking the community to come out and support them and they come to the business you know mm -hmm. to a restaurant to any place to ask them to pay the wages that they have been stolen and i think that that has been working mm -hmm. uh and they, there's a number of cases that have been you know uh, successful they the employees have been paying the the workers and, and that's great the other thing that is has been happening is a lot of education in the community um especially um they, we have uh, with the oregon new central movement and also with just with justice and the faith labor committee that we have, uh, we are uh, developing what we call the labor in the pulpit. And what it is, is that we bring workers and testimonials to, to congregations to share that with those congregations mm -hmm. and educate, you know, about the issue and get their support, you know, so that they uh, also people can sign the pledge, which is a pledge to commit, to help, to eradicate and to stop with theft that also people can get uh, online and, um, and, uh, and get the pledge. Uh, Maybe it's, it's important uh, if people want to know uh, the, the coordinating organization for the whole campaign and mm -hmm. the coalition is uh, the Northwest Workers Justice Project. 
and it's easy. You just need to go to to nwjp.org, which is stands for Northwest uh, Workers Justice Project, and you can find in that page the pledge even to sign it. And it's very important to sign it because that's going to get in a lot of people that is backing up this. And when it's the time to go and um, and introduce a bill, you know, you uh -huh. introduce a bill saying, look, we have so much support from the community that says no, that we don't want to wish death in our communities. Okay, great, yeah. And we only have about a minute left. So t tell me, is this part of a national campaign? Well, this it's connected to, to a national campaign. I think there's many organizations and different organizations in different states working on it already. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very more concentrated on the local, the sure. urban campaign, uh -huh. but but the the campaign it is connected to others you know uh -huh. uh, i uh, what is this organization the um interfaith worker justice is one of those that is working in a national campaign uh -huh. as a part of it you know so it is the, it's a nationally is a problem nationally that yeah and you mentioned a, a couple of unions so i would assume yeah. that they probably have this as part of a national also, campaign yeah. a national focus so a seiu and and, UFCW. Uh, oh, right, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, AFL-CIO probably. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. yeah. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Okay, I, I, th I think that that's just about our time. Well, great. So thank, thank you very much for being here, Thank you very much for, much for having me. Okay, great, good. Okay, so we've been talking with Lisa Frack. Uh, Lisa was the uh, communications director with Family Forward Oregon, and for more information about her campaign, on, uh, sick, on paid sick days, uh, you could go to their website at www.familyforwardoregon.org. We also were talking with uh, Marcos, uh, who is with Portland Jobs with Justice and their wage theft campaign. For more information on, on their campaign, you can contact the uh, Portland Jobs with Justice. Uh, their website is O W, no, O, no, that's not right. It's jwjpdx.org. Okay, yeah. there we go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, or there, the other website which uh, Marcos mentioned is the uh, Northwest Workers Ju Ju Justice Project at nwjp.org. So uh, with that, that concludes our program. Uh, if you uh, have missed an episode of Populist Dialogues, you can now see it on YouTube. Uh, go to youtube.com, search for Populous Dialogue, select the option with the Statue of Liberty icon, and uh, search for Populous Dialogues, and you can subscribe to our series there. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy, and to establish true democracy. Learn more about the National Alliance for Democracy at thealliancefordemocracy.org or a Portland uh, chapter at afd-pdx.org. And so with that, I want to thank our crew today, Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Janet Morris, Beth Kerwin, and Tom Thomas for being here and getting us on the air again. And thank you to the audience for watching. We hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye now.